faster than a speeding bullet. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. More powerful than a locomotive. An idea is like a virus. Resilient. Highly contagious. Able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. All right, James, welcome to the podcast. And uh, before we do any formal introductions or anything, every get, I mean, every listener we have on the show knows that we start these podcasts off with, we get straight to work. We, we get some mental toughness challenges, some fitness challenges, and book recommendations. And, uh, you know, before we even get the introdu- introductions down, what do you have for us as far as uh, a fitness challenge? A fitness challenge uh, to uh, a one minute all out assault bike. Okay. Yeah, that'll, that'll be fun. And I, I would, uh, how about mental toughness challenge? Probably the same thing. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> to be, uh, to take time every day to be, uh, aware, conscious and aware. Okay, great. Great. I like that. All right. And, uh, book recommendation. What do you have for the listeners today? Uh, the way of the superior man. Okay, perfect. I've actually had that one recommended to me, um, from a friend never mentioned on the podcast before, but I'm definitely going to hop on that one now. Yeah, I just have I have it nearby here. Do we, are we taking uh, we have a video on the podcast too by chance? Oh no? uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. I'll check that David out. David. All right, cool. So sorry to throw you right under the uh, under the bus, so to speak. No, I, right, right as soon as we start, I do appreciate you helping me out there. Uh, but now let's go with a, a formal introduction, man. Can you tell my listeners a little bit more uh, about who you are and what you've done, and, and maybe a little bit about your business? Yeah, uh, my name is James Fitzgerald. Um, I was, I'm a Canadian, uh, Canadian boy with, or sorry, uh, I'm, I'm an American with Canadian roots. That's the way I basically uh, would state it at this point in time today. Um, I have, uh, was born and raised in Eastern Canada, grew up um, playing a lot of sports, being very active uh, athletically, um, loved sporting endeavors, you know, hated school. Um, just could not wait to be in part of sport, um, uh, became quite good at a few sports, um, and was, uh, okay at a lot of other sports. So I loved the variation of it. Um, and, uh, I got injured in, uh, when I was 18 playing soccer, which is one of the sports that I specified in. And, uh, then through that rehab, I fell in love with conditioning in the physical body and, um, then wanted to discover more about it. And it just kind of fell into physical education, kinesiology and the science aspect of it. I went to school for that. Uh, I did six years really of, you know, entry courses into kinesiology, into some, uh, um, uh, more, uh, research for the last two years on, uh, on muscle fatigue and then, uh, came out and wanted to go into the free market as a trainer and a strength coach, um, ha- having this knowledge and this base of, you know, uh, ability of, uh, physical education and kinesiology and uh, started practicing my trade as a personal trainer and a strength coach, uh, doing it on my own and working in facilities and just being in the trenches for a while and uh, did that for, uh, ooh, you know, uh, 15 plus years and then, uh, you know, recognized that I was having great success within those business models that I built. I'd scaled out a personal training company a couple of times. I had two CrossFits and was doing some online stuff and then I started uh, getting lots of requests to create a system of my success. Um, of, and so I created an education uh, platform for coaches who want to be professional coaches in fitness, especially in the functional fitness world, um, which was at the time a very important thing. There was a big movement that I was a part of uh, through CrossFit. And uh, so I created an education uh, system for that, uh, which coaches I now coach coaches around the world, uh, both online and in person, um, who want to be a uh, professional uh, fitness coach, um, and uh, we also deliver one-to-one coach-to-client consulting online uh, for anyone around the world for remote coaching. And we have a facility here, which is the lab that uh, we do all of our uh, in-house training and research and content and uh, and delivery for that. That's awesome, man! And Arizona, so you're in Arizona, and uh, one of your it says it on on your website and everywhere that you know you've been around since since '99, right? Um, that's where, uh, OPT, uh, opened as a business LLC, mm-hmm. which, uh, transitioned into OPEX when we moved down to, uh, United States. Okay. And, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You had something, some sort of hand in the 2007 CrossFit games, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> yep. I, I won the, the original CrossFit games, which was held in Aromas, uh, California. That was a pretty, uh, uh, pretty spectacular part of my career. 
and I uh, competed uh, for in 2008, 2009, 2010, um, as well as um, came fourth as a master in 2014. That's awesome, man. That's And you do a lot of work with CrossFit Games athletes uh, now, don't you? Yeah, I don't directly anymore. I stopped doing direct coaching about a year ago, and now I coach coaches who coach athletes who are CrossFit Games, CrossFit Regionals, CrossFit Opens athletes. Okay, very cool. Uh, and, and one thing, I, I kind of have to give the backstory for the um, for the listeners because uh, anyone who knows my background at all, I absolutely love uh, programming workouts. Um, that's just, it, it's, a, it's a big thing, and, and people always ask me, you know, who I've learned from, um, and it's really from other strength and conditioning coaches, like picking up things that uh, Louis Simmons from Westside Barbell, he's done in strength training. And then another big influence, uh, just looking at your programming when you had the Big Dogs blog and everything, I really learned a ton from you, and I've learned that stuff in your blog. Uh, it's been tremendous help. So if I had to like awesome. name two or three people who have influenced the way I program workouts today, you're definitely uh, on the top three list there. Um, and I, I want to know kind of what your influences were because you have a very – data-driven empirical approach to programming and writing workouts um where did that come from and how did you develop it uh so where did the data-driven approach come to in writing workouts yeah because a lot of people aren't interested in the numbers as much and i know that you're very interested in that stuff yeah um you know, I'm not really sure. I think that uh, it was possibly just being in the lab. You know, I just, I think, you know, being a scientist, you're, you're looking for the truth, you know, and you know, doing it, you're not going to find it. But you're, you're saying like, this is the truth. Like I have found the answer to muscle fatigue, you know, right. <laughs> which is a very complicated area. But, you know, you get into that and, and, and it makes you recognize that, you know, if we didn't have the 18 people fill out specific, you know, uh, forms for simple things like total body weight, age, height, and their inventory of food and their training experience and how many reps they did and what, if you don't actually look at that, you're not going to be able to, with the pool, pool of people that you're working with, just use an example for numbers, you're not going to be able to use anything from the, from the work that you're doing to help educate another person, to educate yourself, to see what the effect of, of the training program, to see what the effect of the science was. So the numbers approach to that is almost it almost goes hand in hand with the empirical work that you do in the trenches so you can do you know lots and lots of work but if you don't have proof of that um, or if you haven't watched what the reasoning was behind the success in that training then it's all worth not in the end like if you have it all stored in your head of like oh i just know this is the way that this thing's going to work yet you haven't tracked exactly what that looked like over a period of time, it really doesn't matter um, in the end if you uh, act, you want to educate other people like other clients or if you want to educate an audience in broad form or if you want to educate other coaches, you have to have that. So I think that's just where I was always, you know, loved, you know, math in class. So I would, I'd be the kind of guy in social studies or English sitting in the class going 13 times 8 is 104, 13 times 9 is 117, 13 times 10 is 130, 13 times 11 is 140. Like that's, that's where my head is, right? I'm always, you know, my wife can ask me a question, you know, James, what's 12 times 13 is like 156. You know, I'm, I, I always, I have numbers in my head all the time. Um, when it comes to fitness, I loved it because when you connect the human, um, to the training aspect, I consider numbers truth. So you can, and you can't hide from the truth, you know, uh, like Henry Rollins says with his comment, the iron never lies. Yeah, the iron does have a number, though. So you either can pick up 300 pounds or you can't. There's no, you know, it's like, oh, I can. Oh, we'll go ahead and try it. And you can't. So what is your score? Your score is 210 pounds. Can you do 300? No, you can't. So the number 210 is the truth. So that's a, as an example of, you know, multiple reasons why I think I was connected to that um, is that it allows people to set really clear expectations on their journey in fitness through those numbers. And, and that's something I'm completely on board with. I think uh, before I ever started putting out programs or anything, I had uh, very small groups of people at the time go through them, and I needed numbers and data on everyone before I ever felt comfortable, uh, you know, putting that out there to the world or you know having someone else see my program. I really like to to have all that data. Um, do you mm -hmm. ever look at a? Uh, I, I know some of your coaches do, um, but like correlations between, you know, different. Uh, and and I, I won't 
maybe you have a good correlation that you could just uh, give an example of. But uh, yeah. do you look at that data a lot, how one thing correlates to another? And do you find that to be helpful when you're when you're programming for people? Yeah, well, like, you know, if you're using the word data, the first, you know, if you want to get into that game, uh, you have to have a place to store it and keep it. You have to have people who can mine it and you have to know what to look for. Um, that's a, that's an inter- that's a very important point. So I'll mention a company that we support called thefitbot.com. Uh, we store a lot of our information through there, which is very helpful in trying to find those connections to things. Um, I think you have to do things that are similar over a long period of time and get a buy into some really simple testing pieces and watch it for a really long period of time in order to get you know some of those connections and correlations. So for example, um, we'll use a 30, 30 times row four, four times. Um, so that's 100% all out 30 seconds on the rower, 30 second rest four times. So we're looking for uh, attrition. We're looking for total power output. We're looking for the median and we're looking for the total amount that people can do in the time to get indications, as an example, um, um, as to how their aerobic and anaerobic system is working. Okay. So but but that's besides the point. The point is that's one data point that if we just decide to like test it, we can't just be like, oh, I just tested on four people and this is what I saw. No, we've been testing it for three years with athlete camps, which is like 10 to 18 athlete camps per year that have 20 to 30 plus athletes. We've been testing it twice a year uh, with 500 plus plus clients online that we do remotely. Uh, we have OP, OPEC CCP coaches, which is 2000 coaches testing that in their own facilities, reporting in on one data point. So that's just one data point of that one test. And uh, for CCP, we have multiple other data points, which is coaching coaches. And for uh, remote coaching online, mainly for a CrossFit group, we have other data points as well. But back to your point, you have to, if you want to do that, you have to have some simple measures that you believe in are going to tell you a whole lot about the current organism and how they're doing. And then you got to consistently be able to put those in to get some feedback from the human, which I'm calling the organism, Mm -hmm. uh, to determine exactly where things are moving. Um, And those are just simple tests that, um, you know, just to use even an example of CrossFit, they used to do that like way back in the day. Um, Greg Glassman had that that idea in mind when he was, I think, the sole provider of the workouts from 2002, 2003, up to 2006, 07 maybe, uh, when I was doing it because – he would put in these intricate tests, you know, like a 1K row or Fran or a 10K run or a deadlift 1RM, which are really simple tests when you're doing CrossFit. But all the shit that you were doing in the meantime would go back and you'd look at that simple test. And, and if your Fran didn't go up, then you'd have to say, well, is the program working or not? You know, it's, it's really simple. And so that's why I bought into it uh, initially is like, wow, I'm doing all this shit in the power area and these things are actually going up. You know, so um, that's another example of, you know, maybe a more chaotic environment, but they still use the specific one test as a benchmark to determine if people are actually getting better. Yeah, and I think that's, in all honesty, probably what attracted me to CrossFit in the first place uh, very early on was uh, Greg Glassman talking a lot about, uh, you know, data and numbers, whatnot. And, uh, but I never... You know, maybe I just missed it. I don't feel like he continued down that path. No, it stopped. He stopped. I don't know. I don't, well, I don't know the story, but something happened in 2006, 07, um, where the workouts changed on dot com. And, you know, just those, I just don't know. But the, the old journals were so inspiring, you know, to see, to see um, Greg Amundsen being measured for body weight versus, you know, that's my, that's my idea of CrossFit because that blended pure science, which is measuring a person's body weight plus the amount of distance move for a pull-up, plus the amount of distance move for the thruster and time, that's a true measure of power, you know? So I don't know if it took him seven hours to write that article, but that's the that was CrossFit to me, you know? And then it just went like, ah, we can just put anything together and it's going to work. And that's that's not the way... That's not the way it... And, you know, it should have went over time. It, if it went more of a scientific route, but the, the design was still varied, you know... Um, I think it would have been something special because they would have still been able to say we are improving these data points over a long period of time with all these people um, because we're measuring science. But I think they got away from that, the measurement of it, um, and then it just turned into a production model where everyone can touch it and play with it. And hey, that's just the way it is. Yeah, and that's what, and to be honest, that's uh, how my uh, 
say workout programming journey started i was i have an aviation background and i uh would would sit in my the these classes uh, i was in the air force i'd sit in these aviation classes and uh they give us all these equations. I'm not paying attention. I know my workout for later today, and I would try to predict uh, like the horsepower or something, you know, the, the power output for my workout. And then I would do that over, and, and they're all estimations, to be honest. I don't know how accurate uh, it was, you know, because I was no, estimating. Yeah. And so, but I could tell when a workout was going to be harder, that obviously more power would be calculated. And I was like, okay. And it, and it just seemed to, to work out that way. And so that's what made me fall in love with the numbers. And uh, like I said, that's how I felt too, that CrossFit was more like that early on. And now what you're saying today, it is more of a production yeah, like, model. Like, because because then it got into competition and testing of fitness, right? So this is one little snippet into where my mind goes on that, why numbers are so important for it. you know. And it goes back to one of the tests they did, the marathon test, remember that, on the rower, mm-hmm. you know, back yeah. games years ago. So because if you were to actually look at power, uh, a body weight versus how much work was done in that period of time, the number, the numbers and the scores would all be flip flopped, you know. So Josh Bridges didn't win the games that year simply, be, I believe, simply because of where he finished on that test. And Jason Klepa being bigger in body weight and a little taller, you know, you may say, well, you know, thirty-five pounds doesn't matter. It does matter over an hour when you're on a fucking rower. <laughs> yeah. So if you were to actually look at total power over a period of time with even a concept two adjustment, even if it was right or not, it flip flopped all the scores. So what is a true definition of power? Well, if you're going to put everyone together and measure that, um, you've got to have it for all the tests. And over time, there is some hope because, like you know, there's massive improvements right now in biotech and people are putting a lot of investment and time into that, that there's eventually going to be a power meter um, that will be able to dictate that. You know, the current biotech wearable devices are not there yet, but they're starting to get closer and closer to it um, with uh, beta versions of uh you know, measuring sweat, measuring GPS load, and then being able to determine power on that. If it gets into fitness, it's going to be a little more complicated. But if there's anyone listening that wants at least some ideas on, I got, I got lots of ideas. I just can't execute on it. Yeah. And I'm super interested in, in all of that stuff, but, and I've probably bought every, uh, everything out there so far, which is supposed to kind of help in that regard. And none of them have proved very, very useful. Uh, No, I see a lot of them too. You yeah. know, like, let's just say, what's your body weight and height as an example? I'm 5'11", 185. Okay, so we're somewhat close. It makes it, it doesn't make it very good. But let's just say, you know, you were going up against uh, Josh Bridges, right? So he's, I think he's 5'6", and 100, and he says 175 on paper, but he's not 175 pounds. So let's say he's 166 pounds, okay? So you're going up against him. And both of you do a uh, 500 meter row, 30 kettlebell swings and 30 burpees. And it's a workout and it's at the games and it's for time. You know, both of you should just be able to put in your height and body weight and do the workout. And based upon the time for a logarithm that's determined based upon that, not the time should be the score. Both of you should finish and look up at the scoreboard and a power score should come out, right? That's, that's what, that's how it, that's how the definition of power for CrossFit got me interested. Cause I saw three rounds for time of kettlebell swing row and burpee as a way to do work that was really cool, right? But then it lost all of its vigor because people went for the score on the whiteboard and they forgot about the actual power that went into the workout. I think that's amazing because also just watching the CrossFit games, they had this little, uh, I don't know if they're still doing it. I didn't notice it last year, but it's like a, almost an explanation of CrossFit at the beginning. And they talk about how we calculate power and they, they, they throw a little math in there, but I'm always like, yeah, I, yeah. I, that's not really what you guys are doing at the CrossFit Games for sure. No, yeah, because you have to. I mean, would you recommend having weight classes in that, uh, or just just a straight mathematical calculation to? No, I, it's biotech, man. It's there's gonna be there's gonna be a measure that you know can somehow determine how hard people are working in a period of time with mixed modal efforts. Like there is gonna be some, you know, let's just say they got to push something and turn it over, right? Uh, there's. AI is smarter than us to dictate like friction, the weight of it, how big it is, what the circumference is. You should be able to take a picture with your phone and be like, if this is this weight and I got to push it that far, how much work is it going to take? And then the human does it. Then you say, what's your body weight? What's your height? It goes into the calculation, the distance. And at the end, you're like, what's my score? And your score just comes up on the board. You know, that's, I mean, we're, listen, it's been, look at you and me are talking over a device, right? Full on communication. I can see you blink, right? So, in terms of communication and connection, which is so important for technology, this has been built out easily, right? But just no one wants to invest that time into fitness to be able to do it. Um, it's largely 
you know, people are trying to put so much money into it for bad reasons, which is, you know, big pharma and medical industry so that they can make money on heart disease and overfat people and just make a shit ton of money on a certain, you know, you and me have to somehow find 10, you know, million dollars for someone to put some effort into, you know, figuring out who's more powerful in Carson. <laughs> no one's too interested in that, right? Yeah, that's going to be a, a tough one. To, uh, maybe some venture capitalists or something out there will, will want to back that. Well, um, maybe maybe <laughs> in eight years, uh, Tesla will, uh, Elon Musk will invest in it because he's going to want the top most hundred fit people to uh, ward off the uh, artificial intelligence invasion. That'd be a good investor right there. All right, man. Uh, so let, let's shift gears a little bit because you said you primarily uh, you focus on coaching coaches, correct? Yes. Uh, are you helping them build their business? Are you helping them become better coaches? Uh, is it both? Uh, what are you, what are you uh, doing now? Because you seem really passionate yeah. about it. Yeah, three different areas. Um, we now have OPEX gyms. So we just started that process as a beta version about six months ago, and now we just started our initial licensing. Um, so we're going to be licensing 10 to 20 new gyms every quarter. Uh, so we're teaching these people how to run my education within their facility. So we'll have OPEX Tulsa, OPEX Seattle, OPEX here, OPEX there, you know, gyms all over the world. Um, so we're teaching those people how to run what my belief is in best practices for fitness business within that brick and mortar. Uh, the second level is that I teach coaches all over the world um, of principles of fitness, assessment, program design, life coaching, nutrition, and business. Um, and I consistently do that day to day, both in an online setting uh, where we have hundreds and hundreds of coaches going through that consistently, um, either in live format, as I said, or online setting. And then we have our remote coaches who are here in place, and those people have clients one to one. So they have their own ecosystem of clients but it's within the big bubble of OPEX remote coaching. Um, so coaching clients who are going to be you know, better at uh, life and fitness and then coaching brick and mortar people to open up OPEX gyms and then coaching coaches who just want to learn and, and basically become as professional as possible. Now, they may do it in a personal training gym, group fitness model, YMCA, you know, life fitness on their own, garage gym, whatever the case may be. Uh, we attract all those people. That's awesome. And you know, you seem like a really big thinker, and and I, I love that uh, as an entrepreneur myself because you're, you're, you have a really great program, and it, and it's getting uh you know, throughout the world, and that and that's really inspires me. Uh, what would you say is your you know kind of a uh, big picture vision for like the next five ten years? Where, where would you want to see OPEX? Yeah, so um, I'd say within five years we'll have that. Uh, licensing system running itself, meaning that uh, it'll be a brand that people will recognize. So meaning like people that are not within fitness, the consumer will, mm -hmm. from whatever method it is, is going to have media or marketing or whatever the case, they're going to be like, OPEX, I know that name. I know what that means. I know what it stands for. And I know what I'm going to get when I go train at those places. So that's what OPEX is the brand of the licensing will mean. Um, I think in five years, we'll We'll uh, have a really big, you know, um, stance on, you know, um, people who are really serious about one-to-one -one fitness uh, online in training because um, I don't see CrossFit really moving to the side. And we've really been developing a business system to really uh, be a leader in that market. Um, so in five years, I'd say we'll be, you know, trying to create barriers really to the system of getting clients into that and offering a really exceptional service under that one big umbrella, which is called OPEX. So people know if they come to that name online coaching for CrossFit or for really intense fitness, they're going to get a really solid service um, and uh, and get you know towards their goals really successfully. Um, and I think for the other area of the on-site piece here, we'll probably have two separate locations in five years, um, one that'll be more of a sport uh, situation, uh, maybe even like a philanthropical um uh, a, a sponsored, um, you know, place for us to just grow athletes, you know, because athletes, no matter, you know, if it could be a young football player or, you know, high school athlete, a local CrossFitter, they, they can't afford 300, 400 bucks a month, 500 even for like supplements, coaching facility, you know, and those people actually do need some real quality coaching. And we love coaching those people. So we, we want to make sure over time we have capital to invest in something on that. And then we'll also have an onsite facility, which is uh, which was growing consistently at the spot right now, which is our lab for like fitness. Um, I think within ten years, um, I'll be fifty three, and my kids will. I have two girls; they'll almost be finished school. 
Um, so I'll, you know, probably be teaching at a different level in terms of what our licenses mean, you know, to the, to the big market. Um, I think I'm, uh, my, one of my personal goals is to have a really, really big impact on fitness. I'm not really sure what that, what that means. Um, but I still, I still feel that whenever folks say like, you know, what are you going to be doing in 15, 20 years? I'm like, probably not much different than what I'm doing right now. So, but I, I know that's going to be a big impact on fitness and um, I want to be that person who's uh, up on stage and, and telling people like this, this is fitness. This is what it looks like. This is how you honor that, that word that we call fitness. And, and this is how people deliver it as coaches. And this is how it's done effectively and just honoring that process. Um, as far as the business around that period of time, I could see both of those areas, the online coaching, you know, maybe even taken out, taken over by artificial intelligence and, and uh, technology where people just plug into their computers, like, tell me what to do. And it's like, you know, takes you, you know, a full hologram picture of a coach who's standing by your side, telling you what to do, counting your reps, measuring your power output, you know, oh, the, whole, awesome. the whole gig <laughs> that, that well, I mean, it's, that's where it's going. So um in 10 years yeah that's probably where things are going to be that's amazing man that's really amazing uh, okay uh let's uh you're, you're talking about you know being on stage and having a big Im- impact on fitness so i want to ask you a, a question so uh it's a hypothetical question so say the uh the president or whoever uh calls you up and they're like hey uh you, you know you're big in the the fitness world we think you're a smart guy we want you to have uh, we want you to write a chapter in this book that we're putting out. And every uh, child in the U.S., and, and we'll include Canada, uh, your, your roots there, uh, has to read this book, be tested on it before they are allowed to graduate from high school. Uh, mm-hmm. So you, your your uh, chapter in the book would be taught and ha- be tested on, you know, basically worldwide. What would your chapter be about? Uh, it would probably, <laughs> well... Um, because it sounds like a pipe dream for something to actually happen like that, especially when you use the word government, um, there's, remember, there's just no money to be made. Um, so it's such a profit driven Western society that we're in, um, that I'm not sure that would ever come to be, but let's just answer your question. Um, my first gut instinct actually is to teach people how to work against the system. Okay. You know, to, to go back to honoring biology and honoring evolutionary biology. Um, and then I really test them on those things. So make them ask questions, you know, make them recognize things like, <clears throat> you know, they, they have to be knowledgeable on uh, what happens when an adult drinks, you know, seven times, four nights in a row, mm-hmm. you know, seven <laughs> drinks, four nights in a row. Uh, we, you and I snicker about it, but imagine if you were to teach an eight year old that that's not accepted for long-term health. Right. Do you see that? Now it's like, oh, well, actually, mommy and daddy do that every week, you know? So uh, imagine if we were to teach them that Cheerios is going gonna, is gonna to lead to them probably having blood sugar disruption and issues with emotions at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. You know, so they're like, oh, wait, now that's all I have for breakfast. But this book is telling me that it's possibly not the best choice. You know, maybe I'll tell them that, um, if they don't move for 90 minutes to two hours a day consistently with some kind of activity around their body with breathing and blood, you know, movement and whatnot, that'll actually lead to them, you know, creating disease past 50 years of age. You know, I think I'd be, I test them on those things that would make these children, you know, throughout their high school create anarchy, honestly, against the entire system, all corporations, the whole system. I think you're starting to see more and more generations that are like that now with the advent of uh, vegetarianism, you know, occupying certain kinds of versions of where people, uh, you know, and and their, and their, their purpose beyond it is, is all good. There's not, there's not a, there's not a right or wrong around it, but you're starting to see these movements of a younger generation that's saying, I'm not fucking, I'm not following those rules anymore. Right. These corporations and systems have said, this is the way it's going to work. You just got to eat like this and just follow the school order and right. go to college. And, and now, now people are like, just a fucking second now, you know, like I got to pay for this to come out and not get a job. And if I eat the shit you're telling me to eat, I'm going to die. So how good is that? So yeah, there's a younger generation due to accessibility technology everywhere is getting stories 
you know, of like evolutionary biology. Like you should probably sleep nine hours a night between the ages of 20 and 30 if you don't want autoimmune disorder at 40. You know, and they're like, what the fuck? Like, I didn't know that. <laughs> but now we do know it. Why? Because we have massive accessibility to that. You know, what's funny is anytime I learn something like that, I, f I feel exactly how you just said. Like, I'm just like, when I learn, I'm a little pissed off if I learn something that I feel like I should have known for a long time. Uh, you know, like, uh, cause I, yeah. I've been, uh, I've been into, you know, I corrected my diet, uh, years ago. Uh, and I do think that people, you know what you're saying? People are voting with their dollars more often. Cause like, uh, in, yeah. in my neighborhood, I can get, uh, grass fed ground beef at Walmart, which was like unheard of, you know, you know, just maybe even five years ago, it was unheard of. So seeing things like that pop up are, are encouraging. Uh, but yeah. like I was saying is, um, I'm always a little bit upset when I, uh, you know, learn something that I feel like I should have known for a long time, whether it has to do with training or nutrition. Uh, what do you think is like a, a big one? Maybe the listeners could take away. You mentioned sleep. You mentioned training. Uh, what's a big yeah. you know, thing people uh, could, could take away? Yeah, I don't think there's one thing. I think the learning that you and I need to understand so that listeners can understand it, too, um, is that whenever that comes up, use that energy to help another person. Right. So with the frustration that you feel and the judgment you have about not knowing something, take that negative energy because it is a negative energy that you're holding inside of resentment, which is a past thought and say, OK, how can I switch that? And like today, like right now, create action on helping other people with that issue that I saw myself. So you don't have to run to McDonald's like, you know, uh, I wanted to do when I started learning about it in the mid 90s. You know, uh, Paul Check was one of my mentors and he was like you know, go to the streets, basically, you know, this guy was screaming out this, this n knowledge that I was like, I'd leave every, you know, meeting with him just being like, I can't believe, you know, I, I ate that for 16 years. <laughs> I just wanted to go to McDonald's and like hold up signs like you're killing your kids, you're killing your kids, you know. Um, so find the nice halfway in that energy. Yeah. And, and so what I did, I, I taught people, right? I was like, I'm going out there today in OPT where my business was in Calgary, and I'm gonna change that one person's life in front of me. And if they can leave with that thought that they're not gonna do the same decisions that I w was regretful for, I will feel better about it at the end of the day. And that's called coach fulfillment. That's when you finish your day and you're like, whew, you know, I just, I just changed a number of people's lives, that's exactly what coaching is about. Yeah, I normally turn those frustrations into like two or three thousand word articles on my site. Excellent. So that's the, it, they typically it, that's it. it results in some good somewhere. Uh, you right. know, it's just like man, that that should have been in a textbook somewhere, or like man, I you yeah. know I, I like and you said like it. I can't believe I I did this for fifteen years or, or, or whatever. I have those those same thoughts all all the time. Uh, yeah, you're. I, and I do want to talk because I I've done a lot of research on um, energy system training, but I think that you're like the guy. Uh, I, I've uh, it's hard to find uh, good information on the internet uh, and, you know, just out there on energy system training in general. Um, and the best uh, I've ever seen is the, some of the information you've put out. Uh, do you think that you could give um, a quick 101 on energy system training? Yeah, so it's a, it's a simple concept to think about um, three different, you know, fuel sources that people have when they want to do work. And so we call it gain, pain, sustain. Um, a gain piece would be something that's going to be uh, a piece of work that's going to be fairly fast for, sh for time. The effort is massive and high, and the rest period is going to be long. Um, now, it doesn't mean everyone can do that, but it's, it's still classified as what we're calling a gain you know, uh, version of doing work. And there can be multiple things that goes into that. Um, and it's probably, it's not the most incorrectly done but it's probably one of the most incorrectly done or used energy systems uh, for front-end power uh, pain is basically the next one in which your output your intensity and your speed per unit of time is actually less um, but your brain goes through what's called a uh, a question and answer session of like what am I going to do in this period of time? Like, do you want me to try to sustain this? Because I'm sensing that I can't sustain this. Um, and that could last, you know, from seconds up to like minutes, let's say. And it's a, uh, it, it does take a period of rest to recover from that, but it's largely how much rest you'll need is largely determined based upon how aerobic you are. Um, and then how strong you are dictates how much power you can put into that 
pain area of work. And then sustain is just work that's sustainable for long periods of time. And when you do longer work that's sustainable, it's all considered aerobic and oxidative and sustainable. And the speed at which you do it can vary for all the different gears of what you do for sustainable activity. Um, and that one is the most used but incorrectly used energy system. Uh, people think they do um, aerobic intervals, but they actually don't. They do pain intervals. Um, and then, you know, the story gets more complicated from there. I mean, I appreciate that. I, there's no way I could have had you on the podcast without at least asking that question. So now okay. let's uh, let's shift the gears to to business because there's no way that you accidentally build uh, a massive business like you have or a successful business like you have. So uh, I know it's probably been a long journey. Um, can you talk about maybe some of your influences or you know how you stayed on the path? Uh, and this is probably main, mainly for me as a as an entrepreneur. I've been uh, had my business for about five years, but I was running it while I was active duty military. Uh, and I guess okay. I've been about uh, a year and a half, two years in now, being full time entrepreneur. No, no, not not a side gig or anything like that. So, uh, uh, just uh, any advice on on building that out long term? Yeah, well, uh, I think you just hit a point we want to start with that. Um, I would really appreciate it if you're going to get into the fitness industry that you fucking take it seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, like, don't be a volunteer. Um, I, not that I, I don't, I don't dislike you because you're a volunteer, but uh, we don't need you. Honestly, we don't need people uh, just saying, "Oh, I, you know, I'm just going to do it," you know, for a couple hours a week here and there, and call yourself a coach and then promote yourself as someone who's a health and fitness leader. Um, it would make a whole lot better for the consumer and for all of us if you just called yourself a helper and an instructor, yet called yourself a a barista or an engineer or whatever you're doing full time. Um, so, you know, first things first, if you want to take it seriously, um, you should be at it all the time. It's something that you wake up wanting to do consistently as your vocation. Um, and it's, it's not a right or wrong thing, man. And I, and I don't want people to think that, but it would make, you know, a whole lot easier for everyone who wants to do it seriously and really impact people's lives to not have confusion in the market as to what is good methods of fitness and preparation and what is just bullshit to make a dollar or to right. feel more popular or just to scale a simple, you know, and I get a lot of hate on that because they're like, who are you to tell the market that people can't be inspired by losing fat and then teaching other people about it? Um, I get a problem with that. Why? Because just because you had your own story, that doesn't mean that you could tell 40 other people about it and now start marketing it as a health and fitness coach. You can say, oh, I have Jared's story. Yeah, okay, that's great. You know, no problem. If people want to buy that hook, line, and sinker, I'm great with it. But don't call yourself a fitness coach or someone who doesn't do it full time. So I think first, first things first, if you're serious about it, get bought in. Recognize it's a long-term process. You know, and, and be, to be completely honest, like you know, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So if you're in this to like make a big buck and just sit back in your chair on your beach <laughs> and forget it. Um, you may like get popular with a couple of workouts and have some online you know clients for uh, maybe a year or two but you got no end game in mind when you're just when you're deciding upon that um, you should build a business to get out of the business um, if that doesn't mean you need to leave but I'm doing that constantly every day trying to duplicate myself trying to duplicate my services trying to you know reapply and refine what I'm doing day to day, I'll never leave it. But if you don't build that um, duplication model and an exit strategy for yourself and for your business, um, all the pieces inside of it won't work in the end game. Uh, you can read a book, uh, E-Myth Revisited, that discusses pieces of that um, and a bunch of other books as well. But that's what I would tell that initial uh, person. Um, and, you know, have a, a you know, a, a really strong mission and vision as to what you that really feels good in your heart and don't get convoluted in what you see the market needs or what you see is like a little hole that you're looking to fill uh, people get lost in this like oh but it's needed so i'm just going to jump on it and then get all over it and you might get success in business for four years and then you hate everyone around you you know right. and that's just because you didn't work on what you really what really fulfilled you so if you were like a you know, uh, a, a weightlifting technician, you know, and you're like, oh, the way to get clients to open up a CrossFit gym. And then two years later, you fucking hate your job, right? Just right. Because you bought the affiliation and you knew you were going to get a whole lot of people in. And now you can't even be a technician because no one can move correctly. And you want to be a technician for, for snatch and clean and jerk, you know? 
and you're just like, oh my God, these people are all broken. And all you really do is put your time into three people out of 150 clients. So, um, you know, if you want to do that, what fulfills you and like lights you up, then go after that and make it as a business. And I know coming from my position, some people would say, well, it's easy for you to say because you're in that position. No, I made a lot of mistakes by doing the opposite and I got burned for it. Yeah, and then when I went back and worked hard on the shit that I was good at and loved, I made more money on. So it, it, it does ring true um, uh, in the end if you follow something that you uh, you really love and that you're passionate about, um, it'll work for you. All right, man, I appreciate that. And yeah, that's... Uh... I like what you said about the part-time thing because, uh, like I said, I, I was part-time because I was still active duty uh, military, and so I was just trying to learn as much about strength and conditioning yeah. uh, before I went full-time. And since I have gone full-time, I've probably learned ten times more in yeah. you know the last six months over the entire three years that I was doing it part-time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I couldn't agree with you uh, uh, more about about doing that. But uh, why do why do you think that the the part-timers aren't aren't helpful? Uh, and not, not necessarily like having a, you know, a, a, a story, uh, cause yeah, everyone has a story there, that they could, they could yeah. sell. Um, is, yeah. is that the main point of contention you have with, uh, no, there's, there's a lot of contention points, you know, cause I'm on the back end trying to educate a market, you know, on what fitness is and also, you know, educate the consumer on what good choices are for fitness and 80% of what's out there in terms of a health and fitness educator is basically just fast tracking people through fitness just for profit or just to become more popular. Right. And that's, that's not so, you know, um, it's uncomfortable to hear it, but, you know, I see our, our profession as a trade. So you, you were a technician, right? So you did your journeyman hours, right? A part time work and being in the trenches and learn, but you weren't a coach. So don't call yourself a coach. Right. Now you're a coach, right? Now you're a coach and a business owner. Why? Because you need to put food on your table based upon how hard you work. Right. Right. So it's not it's not that it's a judgment against those who are part time or volunteers. And I know people can see it as that. But, you know, don't get in it if you're not in it to win it or to do it full time and to really fall in love with the profession, because I'm telling you, it convolutes everything. It just confuses. It confuses the whole practice of it. Um, Like, you know, you know, it's and we get we get so caught up in it in fitness because the free market has said, listen, anyone can do it because we're all over fat and everyone needs some leaders for fitness. And I call bullshit on that. Um, it's like having someone come over your electricity in your home. Would you bring in someone who has no idea of code? Right. right? You're like, no, fuck that. I need some. Exactly. Yet we see the human body is like, ah, fuck it, whatever. That guy lost 30 pounds. I got nice quads. <laughs> let's let's do, you know, and then and then maybe not people like you, but people are like, who are you to hate on the guy who lost 30 pounds over six months has got nice quads and wants to teach someone who's over fat? I got a problem with that. Right. right? I got a problem with it. So it, you know, I'm not talking about regulation because that gets a little weird too, but I'm just saying like if you're putting food on your table to become an entrepreneur and a fitness coach, get in it and do it 100% and put your time in. And if you're not, get out. Find another job you know, and find a coach who's full-time professional at it that really wants to make an impact and help you. And, and that that leads one more question. Uh, I'll ask this one, and then we'll hop into the the last questions of the show. But um, so th- that makes me wonder your your opinion on um, coaching education. Uh, I know you provide coaching education, but where would you say uh, a coach should educate themselves? Because, like you said, it gets a little um, like licensure or whatever. You know, like if the government had to be be in control of it, um, yeah. things would be a little uh, weird. Uh, to put it lightly. Um, yeah. So where do you think people should be getting educated? Do you think that they should be getting educated from non-accredited, accredited, uh, non-accredited uh, places, or do you think accreditation is important uh, when you're, you're taking some sort of exam uh, or should is self-taught? Okay. What, what, what's your stance on that? Well, I think the, the entrepreneurism is a big point because you're going to have, you know, if you're going to do business, you're going to be taking care of people because if you know, if you do shit business, then you're going to lose all your money. You're not going to have food on the table. Right. So being the entrepreneur really makes people figure shit out first and foremost. So I think entrepreneur piece of like having some business savvy is a great starting point on that. You can go through education in order to figure that out. You can also read a whole ton of books, right? You can create experiences in order to make that happen. Um, I think actually that uh, our, I'm biased, but our company as well as companies like us um, will be the future of what fitness is going to be delivery for people because there's so much – regulation in terms of like the government or let's call it corporate sponsored education Mm -hmm. and you know who i'm talking about without naming names just to be politically correct um 
they have good principles, but they're missing the boat on what needs to be offered for real world fitness. It's old school academic based, you know, versions of what fitness is. Right. Um, and I think for 95% of all the people out there that need to just start doing fitness, I'll tell you really simply, it's us as coaches that make that shit complicated. Uh, but the, what those folks need, 90% of 5% of almost all of those people is really base level knowledge of physical education, human behavior, and good lifestyle nutrition practices, which ironically is what OPEX teaches, right? So, you know, do, you know, and, you know, do you need a, uh, you know, a 16 day, you know, assessment course to help change 95% of every human's life out there for fitness? No, you don't, right? Right. You need to be able to say, can you bend over? No, you can't bend over. Okay, that's a problem because we need to be able to learn how to bend over, right? Can you walk up and down stairs or do a lunge pattern or push something away? No, I can't. Well, you know, so I don't need to be a, a scientist to understand that aspect, right? When it gets to the 5%, which includes like, you know, some elite CrossFitters, a football player, a sports-specific, you know, area, someone who's in pain, you know, then now, yeah, you got a lot of shit inside of there that's that's called specific coaching, right? That's above and beyond our scope as to what we want to teach. So I think it's companies like ours, along with others in the free market that will say, no, fitness coaching is easy. This is what it should look like. And this qualifies you as a professional when you do it. And I can't say that you're a professional if you go through my cert certificate process. I have to actually call it a certificate. I can't call it a cert certification just due to shit regulations based upon w what we can deliver for fitness. Okay. And that, that clears up, uh, yeah, everything I was thinking. Cause I think, yeah, I do think that you put out, you know, the, probably the best information out there on, on fitness or even what I'm most in line with. I think you and I had the, the same ideas when CrossFit was getting started. And, uh, I feel like, uh, I don't know, you, you went the direction I thought CrossFit should have gone and CrossFit went uh, a different direction. So I, I really do appreciate the information you're putting out. And, and I, I do, uh, like I said, love all of that stuff. But got to ask you the quick fire questions of the show. Every guest gets these. Uh, so first one is the hardest workout you've ever done. Oh, brother. Uh, it's probably the sandbag hill run at the 2009 games. Yeah, I've, I've heard uh, a lot of epic stories about that one. Mm. I mean, in your opinion, what's the best activity for building mental toughness? Um, uh, physical activity. So physical training. Okay. You know, having a daily, daily process of physical training in some way, different intensities allows people to get inside, listen to their breath, their body. Um, I think that's a awesome way to develop resilience and consistency. Great. If you could only have one piece of equipment to train with for the rest of your life, what would it be? Uh, probably an assault bike. Okay. Big fan of the assault bike, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> All right, man. And so this is uh, the question of the show. Every guest gets this. Um, best advice you have for becoming a better human. This is 100% open-ended. Yeah, just wake up. Wake the fuck up. <laughs> People are so much, there's so much information and, and, we've lost awareness lost you know the uh yeah wake up man wake up i like that and, and, and you're going a little bit deeper than uh just getting out of bed there so i yeah, I, I, yeah. all right yeah. man well uh, i'll see if i can help in that mission waking a few people up and i'm, I'm hoping Excellent. uh that we definitely reach a lot of people today with this podcast maybe you woke a few people up uh that that would be mission accomplished for me having you on the show um so in closing, uh, where can people learn more about you, your company, what you're doing? Uh, we've mentioned a lot of your resources, and I want people to be able to find them. Yeah, it's pretty simple, opexfit.com, O-P-E-X-F-I-T.com. Um, and we have all different uh, angles depending upon who your uh, listening audience is, whether you're a coach, person just uh, interested in uh, health and fitness, or you just want to you know, take a look and see what we're up to. That would be the spot. Um, uh, I'm on Instagram. Uh, J Fitz Opex, J F I T Z O P E X, um, and also uh, on Facebook, we can become friends. All right, great. Well, I'll make sure I link to all of those in the show notes when we publish this episode. Uh, James, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. Awesome, thanks for being here.
best. Losers always whine about their best. <laughs>